Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. A few words about this course. This course, titled Science, Technology and Society, Dynamics of Interrelations, attempts to provide a comprehensive overview about the dynamic interaction between society on the one hand and science and technology on the other. Science and technology without talking about society as they become so intertwined. And science and technology has been pervasive in our uh, life, in all aspects of our life. So there is an intimate connection between our social life and science and technology. Located as we are in India, one may ask as to why we should look at what has happened, what has been happening in Europe and USA in the field of science and technology and science technology society studies. As we all know, the scientific revolution occurred in Europe and most of the inventions based on modern science and technology were, pro were produced in Europe and US. It is in these societies that science and technology transformed the economic, social and cultural and political domains of life. It is necessary to understand the trends that occurred in advanced countries. In today's context, the environment has become an important concern. We are witness to pollution of air, water and soil because of the industrial effluence discharged into the environment, thus affecting our life supporting systems. There is a demand that new technologies be environment friendly, that they do not pollute our life supporting systems. The Indian civilization contributed to knowledge in the areas of mathematics, astronomy and medicine in the ancient period. However, modern science took roots only in the 19th century India. Modern technology was introduced in the 19th century. In a sense, we are followers of the advanced countries as we have been importing ideas and artifacts from the advanced countries and of late from China, especially the artifacts. Today, there is an urge in India to contribute to the advancement of knowledge and to produce innovations. Experiences of the Western countries under reactions to the advances in knowledge, as knowledge is applied to produce innovations, we will have to see the consequences of these trends in the advanced countries and how they are going to uh, improve our capabilities or not improve our capabilities. Whether India will remain an importer of ideas and artifacts from elsewhere or whether India can contribute to, contribute to the generation of novel ideas and novel artifacts that are relevant to Indian context is an important question. Obviously, the motivation to produce novel ideas and artifacts calls for reforms in science education and public support to science, education and research. One has to operate in the context of changed conditions of knowledge production today under the WTO provisions on trade-related intellectual property rights where knowledge becomes an intellectual property and access to knowledge has to be uh, gained by paying uh, a cost. So it also demands that we produce new knowledge, we produce new artifacts and uh, generate wealth by patenting them and so on. That is why the new context is a challenge to all of us in India to really produce new ideas and artifacts. We will examine these issues in this course uh, by looking at the literature that has been produced in this area for the last uh, 40, 40, 50 years. So let us look at how this science, technology, society studies have taken roots in the Western countries. Science, technology and society studies lie at the intersection of philosophy, history and sociology. These disciplines initially focused on the internal world of science, philosophy and epistemological issues regarding what counts as knowledge and justification of knowledge claims according to empiricist and rationalist theories of knowledge. 
history focused on dynamics of science in terms of succession of ideas and theories. Sociology conceptualized science in terms of an institution with its own ethos, whose goal is extension of certified knowledge according to impersonal uh, criteria of logic and evidence. Now, STS studies lie at the intersection of philosophy, history, and sociology. As I said, the context of S STS studies in the West or the academic roots of this field, according to David Edge, the in Western countries, Britain and European societies, science and technology, science, technology, and society studies were initiated in the 1960s for A, educational considerations that the students of science should be exposed to liberal education so that they know how the society functions and the role as scientists and engineers in the society. Second, rational basis for science policy making. These were the considerations why the uh, STS studies were uh, initiated in uh, Europe. In the context of uh, the origin of the, uh, STS studies in the West, in the US, the urge is to democratize science against the backdrop of Vietnam War, civil rights movement, environmental movements, and feminist movements. These were the uh, factors that really created opportunities for the establishment of STS studies as an interdisciplinary area of teaching and research. In our context, the context of uh, STS studies in India, see, developing countries that achieved political freedom from colonial rule wanted to achieve economic development by deploying science and technology as a means. This can be clearly seen in the case of India. The perception that scientific knowledge would create consciousness about nature and the universe and thus usher in scientific temper. Acquisition of the ability to apply logic and evidence to carry out social, economic and political life in the population. The idea of scientific temper was basically coined and popularized by Jawaharlal Nehru, the uh, first prime minister of India. Scientific knowledge in the form of modern science-based technology can be deployed in production, in agriculture, and industry to achieve economic development. Soon after acquiring political independence or achieving political independence from colonial rule, the government of India announced the scientific policy resolution in 1958 to achieve the above mentioned goals. So development of science and technology education and expanding and establishing new scientific R&D institutions, uh, scientific institutions and R&D organizations were undertaken. Scientific policy resolution of 1958, technology policy statement of 1983 reflect the beliefs about science and technology and a role in economic development. Science and technology policy of 2000 and science and technology and innovation policy of 2013 to some extent reinforce uh, the earlier policies but also recognize the explicitly the need to innovate in the context of the uh, WTO regime on intellectual property rights. Basically, the motivation to encourage science and technology has been to use science and, science and technology for economic development and social development. Social development would include uh, providing food, shelter, clothing, and education, of course, and also health care. STS studies in India were initiated because of three considerations. One, review of science policy studies, science movements which were started as a reaction to development mediated by modern science and technology. Third, science popularization and public engagement with science and technology. Basically, fundamental questions were raised uh, in, the, in India uh, from by the uh, civil society organizations regarding the role of science and technology in the development of uh, the country, whether it is agriculture or uh, environment or industry. We will discuss these issues later on in the course. In this lecture, we also look at some of the definition of science and technology to start with. Before we do that, let me say that human society evolved by interacting with nature and interaction among men and women in the society. Historically, human beings gain knowledge about nature and nature by experience, observation, and sharing of knowledge with members of the community, and develop techniques in each stage of evolution. Hunting and food gathering, pastoralism, uh, agriculture were based on animate source of energy. 
hunting and food gathering let me repeat hunting and food gather food gathering pastoralism agriculture were based on animate sources of energy that means every activity that was performed in these uh, societies uh, whether it's hunting or uh, taking care of cattle and uh, agriculture the energy that came was from either human beings or from animals that's what we mean by animate source of energy industrial revolution marked a shift from animate sources of energy to inanimate sources of energy and this resulted in increase in productive capacity of the factories and industrial revolution also brought into uh, existence mass scale production and factory based production this marks a shift in the very character of the society to start with in european countries and later on industrialization spread to other countries see now what was the character of knowledge in pre modern societies as i said while human beings could gain knowledge about plants and animals on earth they could not account for the physical phenomena like rains thunder and lightning that came from the sky above they believed that supernatural power up above in the sky controlled these phenomena and the supernatural power had to be propitiated through worship to see that communities are safe from the fury of floods thunders and lightning that sometimes struck the habitations this is the beginning of religion basically historically religion and the practices associated to religion uh, took many forms religion over time became an institution that developed a belief in the existence of supernatural power that's god norms and code of conduct for individuals in a community and thus created a kind of solidarity among the members who shared the belief systems and who subscribed to uh, a world view based on the uh, religion challenge to theological knowledge basically religious knowledge is a theological knowledge most of the religions said that god created the world theological knowledge is based on faith and revelation the belief that god created the world and that god's power controls all the natural phenomena and the power of god is omnipresent all the practical activities that human beings were involved in and the empirical knowledge that they were that they gained from such activities are subordinated to the power of god <clears throat> the power of supernatural being the acts of god revealed to some gifted individuals or chosen individuals i should say it's chosen individuals who in turn communicated to them to the members of the community what was revealed to them by from what were revealed to them by god let me repeat the acts of god was revealed to some chosen individuals who in turn communicated to the members of the community as to what uh, they gained from the revelation any revelatory knowledge cannot be questioned on the rational basis reason or rationality was subordinated to faith it is this knowledge sorry it is this knowledge system that was challenged in western europe beginning in the 16th century empiricism modern system, modern science as a system of knowledge based on evidence and logic started taking roots during the 16th and 17th centuries in europe prior to that theological knowledge system based on faith and revelation was accepted as the way of knowing the world as about which i just now mentioned francis bacon uh, who lived in 16th century a british philosopher argued that we can generate knowledge about the world on the basis of sense perceptions aided by our sense organs we can make general statements about the world by making systematic observations and verification of these observations about phenomena the basic tenet of empiricist theory of knowledge is seeing is believing that is by using our sense organs we can really look at the world and generate some kind of uh, knowledge our sense organs are our eyes our ears our nose our skin and uh, our tongue yes so tongue tastes uh, ears can hear eyes can see and uh, our skin can feel okay this is how we generate uh, uh, knowledge about our uh, surroundings for example if i touch fire i know it's burning right 
So uh, I can see what is a pleasant smell and what is obnoxious smell. So that's how I organize. We organize the world. We understand the world. So in animals, most of the time, sometimes the scent becomes a way of navigating the world. For example, most of the animals use uh, scent that is generated from the body or sometimes generated from their discharges. The next important uh, uh, kind of a milestone in challenging the theological knowledge was by, made by uh, René Descartes, a French mathematician and philosopher. He argued that all human beings are endowed with the power of reason. And one should, not, one should subject all claims about the world to the scrutiny of reason rather than accepting the claims on the basis of the authority of a claimant. That is, one should subject all claims about the world to the scrutiny of reason rather than accepting the claims on the basis of the authority of the claimant. That is, no one should accept what is being said about the world by others without subjecting them to logical analysis. So everybody is, every human being is endowed with the power of this reason. Along with this, a lot of changes were also taking place in Europe. A lot, lot more people also started looking at nature differently by using their observations, empiricist, uh, uh, empirical methods and so on. A departure is made from speculative thinking and reflections on the physical phenomena in the universe beginning in the 15th century, contributions of Nicholas uh, Copernicus, who founded the geocentric theory of the universe, Galileo Galilei, again 16th century, who laid foundations for analytic synthetic methods based on measurement rather than, rather than on speculation, and Isaac Newton, 17th century, who discovered the gravity and formulated the laws of motion, inaugurated the scientific revolution and laid foundation for scientific method. Let me give one statement by Galileo. The Galileo's dictum is measure and measure, the difference of the difference, and the, dif the difference, and the difference of the difference. So this is one of the very, very important uh, departures in uh, looking at the world in, in, by measuring the kind of observations that you make. This is in contrast to Aristotle's method explaining uh, this is in contrast to Aristotle's method of explaining in terms of nature of things and spirit of things. Example, for example, we all are familiar with oscill oscillating pendulum, right? There is a, if you look at the earlier, our wall clocks, there is a pendulum which moves from one end to the other, right? So, if you ask Aristotle why this pendulum moves, it says, he would say that it is, it's nature, it, it moves. Then you ask him, why does it come to rest? He also would say, it's by its nature, it has to come to rest. But Galileo said, you must measure these things. You can always take, uh, measure these things, how much distance that the pendulum travels and how much time does it take to travel. So then you can make a lot of generalizations about the phenomenon. So he extended this analytic synthetic method to uh, the entire uh, process of uh, understanding nature. So uh, that's a very important contribution. Then social acceptance, acceptance of science in Europe. At a popular level in 16th, 17th centuries in Europe, science was not socially accepted. The church was very powerful in Western Europe, although the political influence of the Roman Catholic Church declined. But the Roman Catholic Church uh, remained very important in terms of providing a worldview. In fact, scientists who were studying nature started their, they said, our investigations ought to glorify the God. Our investigations ought to glorify the God. By understanding nature, we understand God's power. So that is how they initially said, uh, perhaps it was a strategic kind of a statement that they made. They said, by understanding nature, we understand the power of God, understand the creative power of God who created all the world. So that is how they legitimized their activities uh, of uh, <clears throat> uh, activities of observing nature by not antagonizing religion. How then the emergence of Protestantism in Europe, a movement against Roman Catholic Church, evolved ethical principles that emphasized manual work, 
in contrast to ideal speculation. Participation work as an activity to be accountable to God and the need to observe in the process of work, need to observe things in the process of work. These changes in the belief system about the universe or about, the, uh, about one's relations with God were in consonance with the empiricist methods and hence science was slowly accepted as a legitimate activity. Over time, scientific knowledge underwent a process of secularization, according to which one can describe and explain phenomena by relating them to other phenomena without reference to the supernatural powers. The term secular means this worldly. In other words, a phenomenon in this world can be accounted for by relating it to the antecedent phenomenon or phenomena in this world rather than a supernatural world. That's how we say today science is a secular activity. Right? Science does not uh, seek explanations by appealing to a supernatural powers. The science, science provides explanations by relating uh, one phenomenon with the other and tries to establish which is a cause, which is the effect. And of course, cause-effect relations are also, you cannot, cause-effect relations. For the first, uh, science was able to provide these cause and effect relations. And uh, this is how we move from a world dominated by theolo theology and revelatory knowledge to a world uh, which is based on observations, which is based on logical analysis, and also based on measurement, and uh, also trying to relate things in this world to other things in this world rather than relating or appealing to supernatural world. Science is a legitimate activity and public support. Today, science has a lot of legitimacy. If you look at this picture, science here, see science without society, neither technology nor science is possible because society provides human resources, human resources like personal, that is human manpower must be there in order for science and technology to be carried out. Cultural resources which includes language, beliefs and meanings. See language is an important source to convey any idea, to convey any kind of uh, uh, information to others. Physical resources like funds, space, infrastructure and lastly society also accords legitimacy to scientific and technological activity because uh, the society recognizes these are worthwhile activities to pursue because uh, they, are, they are going to benefit society in some way or the other. Now let me at this stage say technology predates modern science. That's why in the, last slide, in the earlier slide I put technology first and later science. Before modern science became an alternative knowledge system, to theological knowledge in Europe, several techniques were developed in different societies across the world. In ancient civilizations culture and cultures, techniques were developed on the basis of experience and empirical knowledge, irrigation techniques, temple architecture, making bows and arrows, making chariots. These were uh, also examples of uh, technologies which people uh, developed, uh, there must be some kind of understanding of how to sort of make these kind of artifacts and they must have some sense of measurement. Modern science took roots in the 16th century Western Europe, as I said. Scientific revolution was ushered in by Copernicus, uh, Galileo and Newton, as I mentioned earlier. Now what do, what do we mean by technology? So for unpack what technology is. Technology consists of at least three elements. One, artifact itself, that is the gadget itself. Then the software underlying the construction of the gadget or artifact. Organizational wear, that is social organization needed to implement the technology. Let me give an example of an aircraft. Aircraft is an artifact. Of course, it's a very sophisticated artifact built with the knowledge of uh, engineering, knowledge of material sciences and a whole lot of other science specialities. And today, uh, aircraft are automated. A lot of automatic uh, uh, components are uh, involved in aircraft. But as I said, there, it, 
construction of an aircraft depends on the knowledge of several disciplines like material science, physics, chemistry, and so on. Organizational wear means social organization needed to implement the technology. If you really want to operate the aircraft, you must have, you must ensure that aircrafts fly safely and land safely. In order for safe landing and safe takeoff, uh, we create an entire organization like airports authorities, which will take care of the safety issues. You have air traffic controllers, you have uh, ground engineers, you have uh, people who really uh, uh, maintain the aircraft. And this is what we mean by organizational framework to see that the aircrafts fly safely and, uh, and, and, and they do not cause harm to human beings. Then the other aspect of technology is there is a design component. See, design means if I design a particular, let's say, a refrigerator, two aspects, it must satisfy at least primarily two functions. One is the function for which I built, we build the refrigerator, that is to keep substances at a particular temperature for a long time. And then aesthetics. Aesthetics mean uh, the size, shape, and color of the artifacts. And uh, it depends on individual's choices. Somebody might like a blue color, blue color refrigerator. Somebody might like a gray color refrigerator, and so on. So this is what we mean by aesthetics. Then, recent literature suggests that the design incorporates power relations, which include exclusion and inclusion. That is, who will have access to this gadget? Who will have access to this artifact? and uh, what it means to have this artic artifact in one's life, and what meanings one attaches to having this kind of artifact in our life. This is also part of the design. The designers build this, build their own ideologies, values into the design of the artifact. If one wants to understand the consequences of technology, one should unpack the design. As I said, design itself will tell us uh, what did the designers have in mind in terms of uh, who will have access to this, who will not have access to this, and what it means to have this gadget or, or technology. Modern technology and modern science today interact with each other at a much greater level than earlier. Now let us see what factors shape technology and consequences of technology are. See, factors that shape technology are economic factors. Basically, economic factors refer to efficiency and productivity. Efficiency means how to achieve our goal with less effort, with less money, with less energy. And productivity means how do we increase the productivity of, let's say, productivity of our land? How, how do we increase the amount of uh, grain you produce in an acre? That is, how to increase productivity of per acre land? How to increase productivity of per unit labor? How to increase productivity of per unit of capital that we invest? We will also see that although these are the important considerations, there are also sometimes non-economic considerations why some technologies are adopted. It's not to achieve efficiency and uh, productivity, but to control labor. Social institutions also give rise, shape the technology, because sometimes social institutions like family and marriage and so on also can lead to shaping of certain technologies, as we'll see later. Political power. Uh, of course, power plays an important role in shaping technology in almost every society, not only now, but also in the past. We'll see some case studies later on in the course, how political uh, power shapes technologies. Then next, cultural uh, factors also shape technology, uh, creative pursuits, because no other species produces science and technology. And systems of meaning that what you attach, what meanings you attach to particular ways of doing things and existing knowledge, like we also build on the existing knowledge. Uh, economic consequences lead to generation of wealth. If you increase efficiency and productivity, obviously we generate more wealth. Then the question comes, how do we redistribute the wealth across, the, uh, across different sections of the society? For example, if may, you make continue to produce more and more wealth, but there will be poverty, there, there can be poverty at the same time. So basically, uh, 
the, the wealth we generate also must be redistributed. Uh, redistributive justice is a political question. So it is for the government of the day, the uh, state agencies or state to see how to redistribute this wealth. For example, in our country, we have public distribution system through which we uh, provide food, food items to poorer sections at a subsidized rate. This is one intervention in addressing the question of uh, redistributive justice. Social uh, consequences, uh, technology, science and technology can bring about, uh, technology can bring about changes in the institutions. For example, introduction of uh, domestic electric gadgets like grinders and refrigerators and so on, what impact will they have on the relations between the uh, spouses, relations between parents and children, and what norms are going to be changed because of this in this institution. Then the next is political. Political consequence of technology uh, refer to distribution of power. Technologies can either result in centralization of power or decision making or decentralization of decision making. Cultural consequences include changes in attitudes and meanings. That is, technologies can change our meanings and attitude towards things. For example, you look at advertisements on TV. Most of the advertisements regarding the cosmetics, regarding some lifestyle or consumer durables, tell us that if you use these products, your life will be better. You will be a different person, right? So that's how they change the attitudes. And this change is done by ranking the older ways of doing things and the newer consumer products or consumer goods they're trying to uh, advertise. That is, they say older things are inferior, the newer things are better and superior. So environmental consequences include, as I said, pollution of our life supporting systems like uh, air, water, and soil, and this has to be addressed. Uh, and um, if life supporting systems are uh, polluted, not only human beings, but also other non-human life forms suffer. We'll examine these issues later on in the course. Then what is science? Science can be understood as a body of knowledge, models, theories, concepts. Science can be understood as a method. Science can be understood as an institution. Uh, science is a method I told you earlier that uh, empiricist theory of knowledge and rationalist theory of knowledge are used as basis for development of scientific method. Science as an institution, the moment we mention institution, the term institution means norms. Science is done or practiced according to certain norms or rules uh, because both men and women participate in science and they do science according to certain norms. Science as a force of production means, as I said, today scientific knowledge enters production through technology. And it can be seen in agriculture, it can be seen in industry. As I said, a water car is built by making use of scientific knowledge regarding uh, the uh, properties of materials and the, for example, Newton's laws of motion, etc. A force that changes our consciousness. For example, science also changes our consciousness about the world, our awareness about the world. Earlier, we all believed that Earth was in the center of the universe. The sun uh, went around Earth, revolved around the sun. Sun rose in the east and set in the west. But today, we all believe that sun is in the center of the universe. It is Earth which revolves around the sun, but not the sun that revolves around Earth. This means changes in the consciousness of our uh, uh, changes in consciousness about our world, and that's how scientific knowledge can change our awareness about uh, the world and also our own uh, bodies and our own health. So, what is knowledge? What do we mean by knowledge? I mentioned science. Science is knowledge. Uh, is knowledge and information same or the same? Information is concrete and accessible. Word of mouth 
written records. Knowledge is abstraction. Abstraction means that we describe reality or part of reality. To describe, we need concepts. Concepts are shorthand descriptions of reality. For example, we use the term tree to describe the tree standing in front of our classroom. If the term tree is not there in our vocabulary, we may spend hours, several hours, to describe the tree. Tree, in this sense, is a concept. It is an abstraction. However, in order to understand what the tree means, what the term tree represents in a, a community, uh, using the term must have, must have, must share the meaning of the term tree. Without shared meanings of words or concepts, there will not be any communication uh, in human society. In the sense, language is very important communication, important medium of communication, and uh, the language is a system of science. System of science, that means it includes words, it includes signs and so on. We all must understand the meaning of the signs, meaning of words, so that we can communicate with each other. So in that sense, sharing the meaning of concept is very, very important in a scientific community. Scientific knowledge consists of concepts, theories and models, as I said. What is a theory? Theory is a set of statements that are made in a conceptual language. A theory is a set of statements about the world, about our nature, that are made in conceptual language that provide description of the phenomena or nature of the world. What is it and how is it? If raised the questions like what is it and how is it, we will have a description of the world or of the phenomena. The question what is it provides answer to the nature of the phenomena and to describe we need concepts as I said. The question how is it provides answer to the relationship that the phenomena has, the phenomenon has other Okay, let me repeat. How is the question? How is it provides the answer to the relationship that the phenomenon has with other phenomena and evolution of the relationship? Theories also provide explanation. Explanation regarding the phenomenon. Why is it? Accounts for the interrelations between a particular phenomenon under study and other phenomena. Why they are related the way they are are provided by explanations. Explanation, in other words, is a statement about cause-effect relations between phenomena. There are two parts in explanation. That which has to be accounted for or explained, effect, consequent, dependent variable, and that which accounts for or explains the cause, antecedent, or independent variables. Theories in social science account for the variation in the interrelations among social, cultural, economic, and political phenomena across time and space. Explanation and prediction. The question, what will it be, provides answer to the status of the phenomenon in future. To predict, we need explanations. In explanation, the phenomenon that has to be accounted for or explained is stated first, and it is accounted for by relating with other phenomenon or phenomena. In prediction, we state the cause or antecedent or independent variable first and relate it to the effect, consequent or dependent variable. Example, an air crash. For example, uh, if there is an air crash, we would like to know why the air crash occurred. So normally, there is a committee appointed. The committee goes to investigate the uh, crash site and tries to collect as much information as possible and analyzes the information and comes to a conclusion that the air crash occurred because of pilot's error. So pilot's error is explanation as to why air crash occurred. Now I use this explanation in my future training classes to all the pilots and say whenever you make a mistake or error, there will be air crash. So that's how I predict and tell the pilots in training that they should be careful. They should not make errors or uh, mistakes. So let us uh, look at the various ways of looking at this STS studies or science, technology and society studies. One can uh, see three views. One, 
Science is independent of society, it is autonomous and the divide between society and science is rigid. The second perspective is uh, that society directs science in terms of what should scientists do which is also called an externalist account of science, one way traffic. The whereas the first one is the internalist uh, account of science. The third perspective is science and society interact with each other. The divide is like a permeable membrane. There is a traffic between the two worlds, the world, the internal world of science and the external world. Philosophy, history and sociology of science. I said in the beginning philosophers deal with epistemology, what counts as knowledge and how knowledge claims are justified and they provide internal account of science and uh, it, it always uh, science, philosophers looked at science uh, without relating to the context in which science was produced. History hitherto examined science in terms of succession of theories and facts as I mentioned. Sociology examined social and moral norms that govern scientific community. Uh, these are discipline based ways of looking at uh, science uh, and society interaction. These disciplines I said focused on the internal world of science initially. Internal world of science, theories, models, social processes of knowledge production, functions uh, without any interaction with internal world of science comprising state, market and civil society or polity, economy and culture. The internal world of science is autonomous, it does not have any connection with the external world, uh, wider society uh, and it is based on the belief that scientific knowledge is objective, rational, invariant and atemporal and universal. That means uh, scientific knowledge is uh, universal means uh, everywhere, uh, for example, uh, it has universal character in the sense Whenever we say 2 into 2 is 4, it is everywhere the same meaning, where, whether it is America or India or Europe. In that sense, universal rational means it is logical. Hmm? Similarly, um, the logical statements are everywhere, uh, they are universal in that sense. All other forms of knowledge is socially, culturally conditioned, that is how the earlier uh, philosophers and sociologists viewed. This view was popularized by rationalist, empiricist epistemology. Now, what do you mean by positivist, rationalist epistemology, philosophy of science? Positivist, rationalist philosophy of science. Uh, positivist theory of knowledge says observations have primacy over theory. The scientist's task is to record self evident facts, facts of objective existence. And it is job of the scientist to, to record self-evident facts. The world is governed by laws. The scientist has to look for regularities in occurrence of events and formulate laws about the world by uh, making use of his uh, observations on facts and uh, so on. Then sociology of knowledge or sociology of science, which uh, arose as a reaction to this positivist, empiricist, ration, positivist, empiricist on, and rationalist theories of knowledge, which considered scientific knowledge as universal, objective, temporal, and invariant as is just now mentioned. Carl Mannheim argued, is a sociologist, uh, who said all knowledge except scientific knowledge is socially, culturally conditioned. He looked at um, uh, for example, Merton, Robert Merton in US looked at social moral norms that scientists follow, leaving the content of science as beyond the scope of sociology, as knowledge claims are evaluated by impersonal technical criteria like logic and evidence. This is one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, ways in which the internalists looked at the internal, uh, those who subscribe to internalist view of science looked at science. That is to say, the internalist uh, view of science looked at social moral norms that scientists follow, leaving the content of science as beyond the scope of sociology as knowledge claims are evaluated by impersonal criteria like logic and evidence. As sociology basically deals with variations in the social and cultural phenomena across time and space, it has no role in science studies as scientific knowledge is rational and universal. 
that is this was so basically the internalists argued that scientists especially to start with philosophers said the philosophers who focused on internalist perspective on science who said uh, science is autonomous they said scientific knowledge is generated by using uh, scientific methods that is empiricist method and rationalist method inductive method is part of empiricist theory of knowledge inductive method says we must move from singular observations to a general statement through verification about a phenomenon that is first we have to observe make observations and then verify them and then move on to make a general statement so that is the logic of the inductive method or the steps in the inductive method the inductivist uh, method is based on as i said a, because it's a positivist part of positivist empiricist theory it says observations of primacy one has to make observations without any presuppositions we should not have any kind of a pre uh, thinking about what the uh, phenomenon is going to be like one has to make unbiased and objective observations make observations in a wide variety of contexts make as many observations as possible these conditions have to be satisfied to make a general statement about the phenomenon however these conditions are problematic how they are pro problematic how many observations are adequate in some cases one observation is enough to make a general statement for example consequences of atomic explosion if you drop the atomic bomb once it's enough to make general statements about what it will do to human beings what it will do to non human life forms and what it will do to environment sometimes no matter how many observations you make we cannot make conclusive general statement because of this problem inductive generalizations are made in probabilistic terms where probability ranges from 0 to 1 the closer you are to one the more conclusive your generalization would be for example uh, let me go back to this earlier statement sometimes no matter how many observations we make we cannot make a conclusive statement for example if one were to how do we say all crows in the world are black in color then we are supposed to make as many observations as possible and in as many contexts as possible so it's impossible to exhaust the observation of all the crows in the world that's why we say i observed 10000 crows so far in different contexts all of them are black in color so i say that all the crows probably are black in color that's what we mean by a probabilistic statement deductive method as mentioned earlier rene descartes said all human beings are endowed with power of reason or ability to ability of reasoning or use logic one does not have to accept any claim by others because they are in authority one has to subject all claims to the scrutiny of reason as i mentioned a few minutes ago this method is also called deductive method which is based on rationalist theory of knowledge moving from a general statement to specific instance the general statement can be theory can be a theory or bold conjecture apply the theory in a given instance and draw conclusions from applying the theory to the to the particular instance deductive method works like this there is a general statement uh, and there is a singular instance we apply the theory to the singular instance and then draw a conclusion for example the general statement would be all cats have four legs the instance is this one is a cat and hence this cat has four legs this is a deductive method of trying to uh, make general statements about uh, trying to look at specific instances from looking at specific instances by using a theory or a conjecture problems with the deduction a valid deductive argument may be empirically invalid for example all cats have five legs is a general statement this one is a cat and this cat has five uh, five legs in real world we do not find a cat with five legs unless it is genetically deformed that is in science both inductive and deductive reasoning are used to generate knowledge 
as so the scientific method, empirical and rational, rationalist methods have become accepted method of producing knowledge about the world. However, these are idealized by philosophers in, uh, of science. That scientific knowledge is generated by using empirical uh, uh, inductive method, deductive method, and uh, these are used, deductive method are used flawlessly by scientists uh, and then they produce knowledge. This is an idealized version of uh, the process of knowledge production, which was really popularized by philosophers in, of science. In fact, Paul Farabend, uh, a philosopher, argues in his work against method, outline of an anarchist theory of knowledge. Uh, he criticizes the view that one single method or methodological monism, he calls, can lead to scientific progress. He summarizes his critique of methodological monism as follows, that anything goes in science. That means, he says there could be plurality of various ways in which scientists, uh, various uh, methods scientists use in, in production of knowledge and uh, they are not restricted to the idealized versions of inductive and deductive method. Philosophers of science tend to see science as a finished product. At least that's how the rationalist, empiricist the philosophers uh, look at science without ever looking into the process of production of knowledge. It implies that one does not have to look at the process of production of knowledge that occurs in a given context and at a given point in time. Karl Popper, philosopher of, philosopher of science, he makes a distinction between the context of discovery and the context of justification. He argues that context of discovery may be private affair, but the context of justification is a public activity. That means, according to Popper, we are not concerned with whether Kekwile uh, got his benzene structure in his dream or Newton found the uh, gravity or discovered gravity uh, when he was sitting under an apple tree. We are not concerned about it. Newton proved that there is, in fact, gravity. So how, how for example, Kekwile showed that, in fact, benzene ring has, is like uh, uh, as a hexagonal structure. This is what uh, we mean by justification of knowledge. So they tend to see this uh, context of production as very uh, unconnected with process uh, product, but today's people are trying to see both, the, both that today uh, the scholars in the STS studies see that the process and product are related one has to look at also the process of production of knowledge in order to understand the product. Thank you very much.